All right, so from the top, um, this is the St. George Dinosaur Discovery site presentation, and I will have a Q&A section at the end, um, so everyone get excited for that. My name is Audie. I work for the Dinosaur Discovery site. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a furry, but I'm not alter human. Um, my persona is a lap bunny. I have a background in anthropology and museum studies, and I am an artist, so I did all this art that you see in front of you here. Right, I am turning the page. <laughs> okay, uh, here are some photos of me at work, um, both at the Discovery site and at other museums I have worked at in the past. Just thought it would be kind of fun to share these. Oh, well, thank you, everybody. I'm glad you like my art. Uh, I do do commissions, self-plug. I will have some information about that at the end. Um, if anyone would be interested in anything like that. Alright, so some quick history about our museum. The site itself was discovered in 2000. Um, in, uh, on the border of Washington City and St. George in southern Utah. Um, there was this farmer, Dr. Johnson, he was actually also an orthodontist, he just kind of owned the farms, and he was selling off that land um, to be used for commercial use, and so he was actually leveling a giant hill and um, got down probably about like, I want to say like 30 feet, and discovered um, the footprints that we have at our museum. Um, and for a while everything was housed in a tent, um, and then in 2005 we officially opened our doors as uh, a museum, um, and from that point on we have been working with the public for outreach. We have an active paleo lab and a team of paleontologists who work with us, um, and we actually do a lot of stuff. We are working on publishing a paper of some recent exciting findings. I can't say much more than that about it at the moment. Um, and we are actually still working on some of the dig site that is housed within the museum itself. Um, and it's really nice that it's inside the museum because that keeps it safe from, you know, would-be vandals um, and weathering and all of that kind of stuff. So it's nice because we have a lot of responsibilities in the community um, with both going out to sites like Lake Powell when the water level is low and collecting specimens there. Um, as well as going and checking out construction sites to make sure that there aren't, you know, fossils that are going to be destroyed there and collecting if there are fossils around. We house one of the world's largest collection of uh, dinosaur tracks in our site, as well as the largest collection of dinosaur swim tracks. And, of course, a dinosaur butt print, one of only nine in the world, uh, which is pretty cool. More on that later, I promise. Alright, so, a bit more background about us. We're going to step 200 million years into the past to look at what was going on in St. George when the stuff that happened in this, our site was, you know happening. I'm, again, I just got off of a 9 to 5 shift there. I'm tired. I'm sorry. I'm a little jumbled. <laughs> Alright, so this is our cast of characters. Um, right here, up in the um, top left corner, we have Megapnosaurus. Oh, right under the word characters, we have our Scutellosaurus. Underneath him, we have our little Protosuchus, who is actually not a dinosaur, but is sort of a distant relative to crocodiles. Um, Protosuchus actually translates to, you know, like, first crocodile. Um, even though it's, it's not the first, that's kind of a misleading name. Um, and then down there we have our Dilophosaurus, which is a little bit of the star of our museum. Setting is the, uh, shore of a lake called Lake Whitmore. It no longer exists today. Um, but back 200 million years ago in the early Jurassic period, it was this massive lake covering a lot of southern Utah, as well as reaching into Nevada, as well as Arizona. 
Um, you can see in this painting here a Megapnosaurus swimming and leaving behind these little swim traces some armored fish, which we find a lot of remains of at our site as well, and a dead morphodon, which most likely lived here. Here are, again, some uh, our little friends. We have some statues of them in the museum, and they are just so cute. I could not not share them. So, from uh, left to right, we have our Protosuchus, the Scutellosaurus, Dilophosaurus, and then down at the bottom, the long boy is our Megapnosaurus. All right, so back to that butt print I mentioned earlier, we have, um, so this, uh, in the top right corner, you can see, um, kind of an outline of what would have happened here. Down in the bottom left corner, we have a cast of it that we keep up on the wall that makes it a bit easier to see, and then down in the bottom right, we have the actual piece in the floor, um, and this has never been moved. It is in its original location inside the museum. Those giant cracks you see are not machine-made. They're actually naturally occurring due to the movement of the tectonic plates uh, in the area and over time. Um, and then up in the top left we have that reconstruction of <laughs> what this guy might have looked like while he was taking a little sit. So our Dilophosaurus was walking along the shore of Lake Whitmore, decided he was tired, and sat down. So you'll see the blue outlined footprints and little butt print circle. Uh, that's where he first sat down, and then decided he wasn't actually that comfortable. So you can see that he actually scooted forward and left that second pair of footprints and a second butt print. Um, which is just really funny. I like to call him the boot scootin' dinosaur, because he's boogieing. And, uh... You can also see, outlined in blue, some um, hand marks, which is actually a really rare kind of trace fossil to find. You don't find um, hand traces that often. Something that a lot of people don't know about dinosaurs is, um, I want everyone at home right now to do T-Rex hands for me. I'm assuming that you're all doing T-Rex hands right now. I'm going to tell you something very sad and shocking. Dinosaurs could not do that. Um, they actually could not turn their wrists in. They held their wrists towards each other, like they were holding a basketball or something. So being able to turn our hands inwards like that is called pronating our wrists, and we have enough bones to be able to do that. But dinosaurs did not, so they actually couldn't hold their hands like this. Um, and once you know this, it feels a little like forbidden knowledge, a little cursed, because now every time you look at a Jurassic Park Velociraptor, it's going to look like somebody just snapped their wrists. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I can't bear that burden alone, so I'm sharing it with all of you. It's really cool that we have both those two separate butt prints, the behavior of it moving forward, um, as well as you can see this footprint outlined in green up towards the uh, front of that photo, and that is actually because he actually got up and walked away. If we go back to the picture of our Dilophosaurus statue, we have placed him in two poorly preserved tracks that actually um, are walking away from the butt print track. So that's... That's our squatter, or the crouching dinosaur. Depends on who you ask, if it's sitting, crouching, squatting, boot scooting. It all, it all depends on your perspective. And that's something that's actually really cool about trace fossils like we have at our site. We do not really find that many bones. I believe we have found two small vertebrae and a tooth um, from a dinosaur at our site. Um, and that's because the processes that it takes to fossilize um, traces like footprints, mud cracks, water ripples, butt prints, all of that, they're very different from the processes that it takes to preserve the bone. So you don't generally find both of those together. You either find one or the other. Um, and we have the footprints. But those are really cool because instead of just telling us what these dinosaurs looked like, it actually gives us a direct insight into their behavior. So in different areas around our museum, you're able to look at these trackways where, mu where uh, the dinosaurs were walking and you can see where another dinosaur would have intercepted with them. One of my favorite little fossils that we have in the museum is of a bunch of bug burrows. Um, 
So a bunch of bugs would have been living in a colony right there. And there is a Growlator track, which is the name for the Megapnosaurus' tracks. Um, and it came and it stepped right on top of the little <laughs> bug colony. Which, you know, that had just had to have been the worst day ever for them. I think it's a really funny little piece of preservation. And it's cool to, you know, think about dinosaurs, you know, stepping on bugs on accident and running around and meeting up with each other. And, um sitting down, because it's not something that you often see in dinosaur media, because uh, a lot of dinosaur media represents them as sort of movie monsters. I hold a grudge against the Jurassic Park franchise for this. Um, <laughs> go watch Prehistoric Planet. <laughs> Alright, here are some more trace marks from a Megapnosaurus swimming in the lake. So these tracks actually helped clear up a lot of the controversy that the paleontological community had over whether or not dinosaurs would voluntarily swim to go, say, like, catch fish or to travel across a lake. Um, they did! And we know that because we found a ton of these traces at our site. So these were from um, a Megapnosaurus or a similar small dinosaur swimming along, sort of almost doggy paddling, and when its little feet claws hit the ground, it would leave these scrape marks. And so that's what we can see here. Maybe asking yourself, how did this happen? How were these footprints um, fossilized? And that's a really good question. So I have a very helpful, simple little diagram here. So a dinosaur comes along, it steps down into the soft, um, silty, muddy um, environment near the lake and that creates a little fo uh, footprint impression. And um, then, you know, the waves come up from the lake shore, or wind comes along and blows more sand, and other types of sediment get deposited on top of that footprint layer, um, which creates two distinct layers. One of them is the mold, and one of them is the cast. So it's a natural cast of that footprint. Um, and we have both of those on display in our museum. A lot of times we have the casts a bit easier to see around the museum because they're easier to make out to the untrained eye. Um, I consider myself in sort of a middle ground for being able to spot these footprints in our museum. There are some people who can see something where it's like, I wouldn't even be able to tell that that is like a mark in the rock. Um, paleontologists have insanely good eyes. I don't know, they must be eating their carrots, I'm not sure. Right, and now I have some photos um, just from around the museum of things of interest. You can see over here is our Katie Bell track. Katie Bell, like a name. Uh, that is our baby dino track. The dinosaur that made this would have been about four inches tall, just an itty bitty little baby. It's so cute. This track is just barely an inch from tip of the toe to the back. It is so tiny and so adorable. And then right over next to that we have one of our uh, employees working on cleaning off some of our tracks. You know, it, they are rocks and they do get dusty and they do still sort of break down over time. So every once in a while we like to just gently take a brush over them and make sure that things are nice and clean and that they aren't getting chipped. Um, because if they are getting chipped, then that's probably happening because of guests. So we would like to keep a better security on those specific blocks to see, you know, oh, is a kid jumping up on this? Stuff like that helps us keep everything in check. Right here is our um, boardwalk section. And all of this that you see in front of you is the active dig site. So the museum was built around this. That whole lighter, whiter layer is basically garbage rock. We are actually just working on stripping that away sheet by sheet, layer by layer, almost like pieces of paper, um, to get to what will be underneath, which will actually be a lot more dinosaur tracks. So once you have the time and resources and money to be able to um, dedicate our attention to doing that, we're going to find a lot more tracks under this, and that is very exciting because this is in the same little bed where there are a handful of little tiny baby dinosaur tracks, as well as some other um, Batrachopus tracks, which is what we call the tracks from uh, Protosuchus. And it's very interesting, you know, this is just like 15 feet away from where the sitting dinosaur trace is, so who knows what's going to be underneath this. Um, that little grid you see on that 
big old piece of butcher paper. That is a map of the site. Um, similar to archaeology, paleontologists use a grid system for mapping out their sites, and that has a little map key of all of our known footprints. It's really cool to go look at. Um, we don't allow guests to walk down here because it is very fragile, um, but you are able to walk around the uh, entire perimeter on the boardwalk. Another view, we have a lovely mural made by a local artist up on the wall. Um, you can see uh, we have some Dilophosauruses up there, as well as some different pterosaurs, including more dimorphodons, uh, per little protosuchus over on the left hand side, and megapnosaurus swimming. Alright, here we have a photo I snapped of our paleo lab. Something about paleontologists and even paleontology volunteers is that they are recluses. They are very secretive and they like to hide. Um, so you really just have to go straight in there to get a photo like this. You don't see them outside very often, so it is a treat when you see them. They are very sweet people. I love them a lot. Um, these two older folks on the right-hand side are actually volunteers who have been with us for a very long time, um, build up enough trust with us to be able to handle our fossils directly, and they have been fantastic. Their names um, are Sally and Alan, and they are just absolute sweethearts. And then over on the other side, we have two of our younger um, college-age uh, workers. So they are actual employees of the museum, and they are also working on some fossils. Cleaning off the fossils takes a really long time, um, and getting them out of the rock that they are encased in, because the tools that you have to use are basically like dental picks. Um, you can imagine, you know, imagine just like taking that thing that the dentist is, you know, messing around in your mouth with and <laughs> going outside and trying to chisel away a bunch of rock with that. It's very tedious work, um, but, you know, I really respect them for being able to do that and having the eye for it, even just being able to see which part of the rock is part of the fossil in which needs to be taken out. It's really cool. These people are fantastic. I love them a lot. They, you know, they deserve our whole hearts. We have some more video photos of the museum. Uh, up in the left corner, that is a uh, just general view of the museum. Um, next to that, in the right upper corner, is our T-Rex skull, which we actually just got um, about a year and a half ago, I believe. Um, it is a composite replica, which means that it, it was made off of the skull remains of a few different T-Rex specimens, specifically three, uh, Sue, Scotty, and Stan all worked together to make this beautiful replica skull. Um, paleontology is like, it's a lot like trying to solve a puzzle without all the pieces. Um, you know, digging into a puzzle box that you bought at the thrift store, and it's just missing a bunch of them, and there's nothing you can really do about that. Uh, every time we find a fossil, for the most part, it is fragmentary. It is very, very rare to find a fossil that is articulated, so that would mean that it is, you know, still preserved in the way that the animal would have been put together when it was alive. Normally they're very jumbled up, or just very fragmentary. Bones get lost, destroyed, Maybe, you know, part of that was eaten by another animal before the dinosaur had the chance to be fossilized. Um, so a lot of times it does take several dinosaur specimens to be able to make a complete um, composite like this. Um, and then down on the bottom we have some more examples of very large tracks that we found at our site. So these were most likely made by fully grown adult Dilophosauruses. Um, Jurassic Park unfortunately lied to you once again. I promise I didn't come here just to shit on Jula Jurassic Park, but um, kind of comes with the territory, unfortunately. And I will say I do like I do like the movie. I do enjoy it. I just don't appreciate all of the um, misconceptions that it popularized. Um, you can see down here. These are and I really I should have put my hand in the photo so you could see for reference. But Dilophosauruses were actually very large, unlike in the film. Um, they did not have frills, 
and they could not spit venom. There isn't any animal that can spit venom that we are aware of throughout history. Um, but they did have two large head crests on their head, and they could grow up to be about 20 feet long. They were the first sort of apex dinosaur predator. Um, and, uh, yeah, they were the first, like, theropod to get up to that size during the early Jurassic. All right. Right here we have um, a mu uh, exhibit in the museum that is still in progress. Those little signs that you see hanging on the outside say, please forgive our dust. We are still working on this. So we are still working on building exhibits within the museum. Um, one of our biggest goals, um, money-wise, and something that we're really looking to do with donations is building a second um, like institution building. We need more space to be able to house all the stuff that we have. A lot of our collection, unfortunately, is being housed in wooden boxes outside, um, which is an okay short-term solution, but it is not best for the long term. So that is kind of our biggest goal, is to be able to make a second building, not only to become a um, better place for storing things so that we can also help out museums from around the state with storing things, um, which we are actually housing some stuff from the University of Utah right now, um, but also building a second area for museum guests to enjoy. We would love to expand our exhibits and have more. Again, what do we do here and why should you donate to us? What would you be supporting? Research and publishing papers. Those are um, big things, especially right now. We do a lot of local outreach with schools uh, in the area, especially within Washington County, but also outside. I know that we've even done stuff with schools from Nevada and Arizona before, um, since we are very close to them. Um, camps, summer camps, retirement homes. Um, we do stuff with retirement homes as well as In Circle, which is our local um, gay pride institution here. Um, we also provide a safe space for community service workers um, who need to do community service hours for the government. Um, we do go on paleontological digs, um, and we also support a lot of local artists and vendors. Um, all the museum, uh, <laughs> excuse me, all the statues and art that you see in the museum were done by local people. In fact, the person who did all the illustrations that are kind of our stock images that you saw earlier on of what our animals looked like were actually done by an artist who has a fur affinity account, which is my little fun fact. Um, but we love to support local people. A lot of our gift shop stuff comes from locals. I have stickers that I have created that are in the gift shop. Um, so when you donate to us, you're also helping us be able to support local creatives, and that's really cool. Um, as well as, you know, we really want to have that second building. It is honestly just such a dream for all of us working there. Um, barely a day goes by where we don't go, ugh, that second building, you know, and thinking about stuff like this. So how can you help? Great question! You can donate to us. Right down here I have a link, utahdinosaurs.org slash git dash involved. And we have a link to our PayPal to donate on that site. Um, there's a little button that just says donate. Hit that. Um, if you are um, willing and able to donate to us, we appreciate it so, so, so much. We're so grateful to OtherCon for sponsoring us as a charity. It means so much. Um, we really want to be doing more with our museum, and that's just been sort of a roadblock for us is having those funds, since we are in a smaller area. Um, also, come visit us! I would love to see you guys! Um, I, I, like, I will give you a personal tour, you know what? Just, like, ask for me if you come in, and I will give you a tour! I would love to see you guys coming in and visiting us! As well as, if you live in the area, please volunteer! Um, we, on that same webpage that is listed right there, we have information about volunteering. Um, we're always looking for people to come volunteer. We have all sorts of stuff, be it building those boxes to keep our collection in, cleaning up around the place, talking to guests about the site and giving your own tours, or, you know, if eventually being able to work in our paleo lab alongside those paleontologists. Um, 
if that's something you're interested in, you're living in the area, please look into that. We'd love to have you. All right. Um, so, because I said that uh, I was going to throw this up there, because um, <laughs> some of you guys did like my art, if you were interested in commissions or buying any of my dinosaur stickers, that rainbow di uh, triceratops that was, one on, that was on one of the earlier slides, uh, that is one of the stickers I sell. I sell some other pride dinos as well. Um, so you can DM me on Discord uh, at Audi7676, and I also do art commissions. I would love to do some stuff for you guys. Um, if you would like to give me a tip, I have my coffee listed right there. It's under Audi Cosplays. If you would like to tip me so I can go buy dinner after this, I would appreciate that too. Instagram, you can find me as Audi.bun, and if you're interested in following my dinosaur-themed Tumblr, it is under truedaunted.tumblr.com. Alright, I'll put that back up in a second. Now is the time where you can throw up your questions in the chat, uh, and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Pat says, I've seen paleontologists in a lab in a museum. They make the lab an exhibit and you watch them work behind glass. Very creepy. The elusive paleontologist optologist indeed. Yeah, we actually also have the same thing. They hate it. It's very funny. I like to poke fun at them about it when I take tours through. Um, also, sometimes they are working down the track surface while we are doing, um, like, while we have guests in the museum, and they hate that as well. It's kind of funny. They almost look like zoo animals down there in their little enclosure while people watch them from up above. asks, what's your favorite dinosaur and why? Oh my god, that is such a hard question. Um, we can't just ask somebody that. You know, I have such a soft spot for true dauntids. I know it's a wastebasket taxon, but I still love them. And uh, dromaeosaurs, dromaeosaurs are the uh, raptor family, that's their fancier name. Um, uh, I just, I love them. I think they're such little cutie patooties. I, I love them. True Daunted is still real. Yeah, True Dawn is real in my heart, too. I love them. Um, Mercury asks, when will the new part of the exhibit be open? I want to see it. Last time I went, they were putting stuff in. So it is out in the open, and you can view it right now. Um, I believe in the coming months we are like coming like two months we're looking to have it completely polished and finished off um but you are able to go look at it right now and it's kind of fun to be able to see like an exhibit in progress what goes into determining the species of a fossil that is a really good question um so a lot of it has to do with what formation we find it in and um formations are going to be the layers of rock basically um, so what layer we find it in determines how old it is, as well as the area of what do we know already lives here. Um, so like our fossils at the site, we kind of just match them up to dinosaurs that we know lived in this area at this time, um, and would have been the right sizes to make those. And it is actually entirely possible that we're wrong, that the dinosaurs that made these tracks here are actually species that we don't know about yet, and if we ever discover that, it's gonna be a little annoying to change all of our branding, but it'll be really cool to make a discovery like that, and I'd actually be really excited to see something like that happen while I'm here. I love everyone for saying the dromaeosaurus stuff. Rainy asks, when extracting trace fossils like tracks, how do you tell where the tracks are and where the layers separate when first discovering the fossil, as opposed to accidentally cracking straight through the whole thing? That's a really good question again. Um, so what's interesting about the rocks that have these fossils in them is that because of the way that they were formed, remember those two layers, the cast and the mold, they actually start to naturally split apart at that seam. Um, so a lot of the times you can actually tell like where you're supposed to be splitting it. Sometimes you do mess up though. That just happens sometimes. Um, paleontologists aren't perfect. They do mess up. Sometimes not just on um, 
fracks, but on actual bones. For example, the um, our curator slash our head paleontologist, Andrew Milner, he was, bless his heart, he's one of the people who discovered Diablo Ceratops, um, which is a large ceratopsian from southern Utah. Super cool animal. Um, he, uh, while working on the skull, he accidentally put a saw straight through the beak, and so now when you see uh, Diablo Ceratops uh, skull replicas, they have this little notch in them up by the beak, and that is because Andrew did an oopsie and <laughs> put that saw straight into its face. So, you know, and it's funny that they leave that in in the reconstructions. I always love seeing that, and I'm like, oh, Andrew, what a guy. Uh, he's a... He's a funny man. Um, but sometimes those things happen, and you know what? It, it just happens sometimes. Yeah, of course. Chaotic says, what's one of the biggest misconceptions about dinosaurs that the wider public accepts as fact? I know you already covered a couple, but I'm curious to hear more. Um, that's a good question. So I know I talked about Dilophosaurus. And I talked about um, wrists. So those are big ones. Feathers, uh, kind of knocking out two birds, one stone here. Um, dinosaurs, a lot of them did have feathers. Mostly dinosaurs from the Cerithian family, but also dinosaurs in the uh, other family had them as well. Um, so most bipedal um, theropod dinosaurs probably did have feathers. Um, to varying degrees. Some were definitely fully covered, some probably had more sparse coverings, but we definitely have evidence of them and, you know, for example, like, Velociraptor in the Jurassic Park movies would not have looked like that. Um, they were much more like, imagine a giant hawk that runs around on the ground and eats animals the size of elephant calves. That would have been a bit more uh, <laughs> accurate to what something like a Velociraptor would have looked like. Velociraptors are not the largest raptor or dromaeosaur. Their the title actually goes to the uh, Utah raptor, which we also love. We have a Utah raptor leg in our museum. It's great. Uh, so yes, dinosaurs, some of them do have feathers. Some of those were kind of a full covering, like modern birds. Um, and some of those, it was just sort of feathery quills. Actually, pterosaurs also had feathers, we discovered that recently. They were very fine and more like hair, but it was feather material. Way to go, Andrew. Yep. <laughs> Way to go, Andrew. So I'm poking around all the different chats to find questions here. If we were speculating about Microraptor behavior, how would we do so? Um, so Microraptor specifically, I don't know a ton about. Um, cute little guy, had the four little wings um, on its hands and feet. We do actually know what colors they were, which is interesting. We do actually know the colors of some dinosaurs. Um, but as for their behavior, um, I'm not entirely sure. I, uh, if I'm being totally honest, I don't know a lot about them. Because I am not really familiar with any track sites that we have um, kind of attributed to them or anything. Um, so what we can tell from what I know off the top of my head is mostly just stuff that we can determine based on its bones and looking at, you know, other dinosaurs that we know a bit more about, the way that, you know, what it kind of what it would look like, and we look at animals that are similar today. Okay, so I opened Pandora's box, everybody's curious about the colors. Um, <laughs> how dare you not know every fact about every dinosaur on Earth? Honestly, 
I unironically feel like that sometimes. <laughs> um, knowing dinosaur facts and working in museum education can be a surprisingly competitive type of thing. Um, if we're speculating, oh, sorry. What dinosaurs do we currently know about the colors of? Curious about the colors. Okay, so dinosaur colors, um, we know because every once in a while we find a fossil that is remarkably well preserved in the area of the skin. And usually we find that in layers that contain ash because ash is a very, very fine sediment. So the way that it preserves things is different from something a bit grainier like sand or just like normal sedimentary rock. Um, so we're able to see the fossilized remains of melanosomes, which are the cells that carry melanin, which, you know, gives us our color, gives animals their color, their pigment. Um, we're able to see those with um, mi microscopes, so we actually call them microfossils because you have to look really, really, really close to see them. You're not going to see it with your naked eye. Um, so we're able to look at those, and you cannot extract DNA from a fossil. Um, in fact, you wouldn't be able to extract DNA from anything that old. Um, I believe the farthest we can go back is about 100,000 years um, because of the rate of decay. Um, so we're able to but we're able to look at the shape and the pattern of the melanosomes and compare that to the shape and the pattern of melanosomes in modern animals. So we're able to look at it and go, okay, well this matches up to orange in modern animals, so this part of this dinosaur was probably orange, and this part matches up with brown, so it's probably brown. Um, so I believe that we know about Eight of them. The ones that I'm very familiar with are Cenoceropteryx, which is my favorite of the bunch, Cetacosaurus, and Microraptor. Uh, Microraptor, we know that they had glossy black-blue feathers, sort of like a crow or a raven, where they would have been a bit iridescent in the light, which is really neat. Um, Cetacosaurus would have been um, brown on its back and a lighter tan belly and it had um, kind of stripes along its back which would have helped it with camouflage like modern animals. Um, we know a lot about Cetacosaurus down to the shape of their butt because we found a fossilized one. Um, apparently we're all about the butts with this site. We don't have any here. <laughs> they are not an American dinosaur. Um, Thank you, Rainy. That is a Cetacosaurus. So this is a super, super um, accurate reconstruction of one. Down to those quills, those quill feathers, we even have those fossilized. We're not sure how dense they would have been, but most scientists theorize that they probably, they were feathers, but they probably would have been like quills. Um, and we think so Cetacosaurus is actually a very basal ceratopsian, and we think other members of the ceratopsian family, so Triceratops as relatives, probably had stuff like that on them. Um, and then Cenoceropteryx. <laughs> yeah, that's how you pronounce its name. Uh, a part of my job is occasionally getting schooled about dinosaur names by my uh, co-workers. Yep, that's Microraptor. It's really a gorgeous animal. I love to just call them tacos. Mm-hmm. And then Cenoceropteryx is my little favorite, such a cute little guy, and it is orange and has white stripes, and it has a big fluffy orange and white striped uh, tail. And I love them because at my family's house, um, which unfortunately I live so far away, I barely get to see the kittens, but we have these two kittens, and one of them, uh, she's a rare little orange female kitten, um, she is so fluffy, and she is orange and white, and she has that big, fluffy, orange and white tail, so I like to call her a sunny Seropteryx. They are very pretty. Let me find a photo real fast.
someone else already got the exact photo I was going to do. Thank you so much, Rainy. I'll spell it out. So, you know, so... such a cute name for a cat. Thank you. She is a adorable cat. Oh, yeah, Notosaurs. Um, Borealopeltis. That is the Notosaur, so uh, sort of like Ankylosaur, that we have a really, really good fossil of. Basically, um, just mummified. It's from Canada. We get a lot of cool stuff from Canada. Shout out Canada. Uh, <laughs> that's the bitch. Yep. Um, and that one we do know the colors of, if I remember correctly, it is sort of a reddish brown. Hi. Um, I would have to assume for both display, so wanting to look hot and sexy to the other dinosaurs in order to find a mate, um, as well as, oh yep, there's Boreal Pelta, as well as, um, camouflage similar to tigers or a lot of other modern animals today who have stripes. And also just because it's cute and they are cutie patooties. Can you talk about crinoids and nautiloids on site? So we actually do not have any um, because this was a lake site and not an ocean. And um, this site was taking place a bit more recently in time than we normally see crinoids and nautiloids. Um, although I have handled a lot of them at work with different outreach activities, since they are very common fossils, you can actually just buy some on Amazon. Uh, that is that is how common you, they are. You can buy legit ones. Um, so we use those for a lot of our outreach activities, actually, with allowing kids to get hands-on with fossils, as well as different, like, sorting activities and talking about the ancient ocean. Reminds me of the lemurs on the movie Dinosaur. I cannot speak to the accuracy of Dinosaur. It was not accurate, however the Carnotaurus is still objectively cool despite being not correct. <laughs> they made it cool, so I can- oh god, no. No, the lemurs, no. Uh, Cat says, question. Where do you see the field of paleontology going? Seems like humanities and other non-STEM things receive less and less funding every year. Um, yeah, so that is definitely something we struggle with. Um, luckily, there are a lot of individuals who are really interested in paleontology in that sort of work, and we do actually receive private donations from people like that. And so that is always really appreciated, you know. Um, you know, it's such a blessing every time we get stuff like that, but funding is definitely a big struggle. I do believe that the field of paleontology is going to um, keep looking up, especially with findings coming out of China and other parts of Asia right now. Um, but specifically China right now, they are finding a lot of really cool stuff there. It's where we find a lot of uh, those fossils that have those ash layers. Um, so I'm sure that we're going to keep finding... Um, really interesting remains uh, coming out of non-American sites. Um, there are, you know, young people, people my age, like me, who are invested in this, and even though, you know, I personally, I find field work a little boring, it's not my cup of tea, um, but I love education, and, you know, being able to inspire that interest in people in the public is something that really brings me a lot of joy. And I meet kids every day who want to, you know, be paleontologists. And, you know, maybe that's something that they're going to grow out of. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And so, like, I really like encouraging people like that. Um, 
Because as long as people are interested in it, it is going to keep growing as a field. Um, and so I do think that there are going to be bright spots in paleontology's future, even if it is hard to find funding. Watching this with no context is the funniest thing imaginable. I want you guys to know that. I'm glad. I guess if you're watching this with no context, you might not be listening, so you don't know what I'm saying, but I'm, I still think that's funny as hell. Sorry, I'm just watching your little cat and chaotic are typing, waiting. I'm certified to run matchless programs, and a lot of them are geared towards getting people invested in fields that need some more support. I think inspiring fat, passion in kids is effective. We just need to maintain it at all. And I agree completely. That's I love telling people, you know, you can go to school for this. I went to school for stuff like this, anthropology, um, and museum studies, you know. It's a completely viable career, and people can do it, and I think sometimes people just don't realize that you can do it. Oh, Chaotic, thank you so much for uh, finding that article for people. Dana says, I read Raptor Red recently, and it was pretty cool. wonder how much of it is accurate still. You know, admittedly, I haven't read it yet. It is actually on my list. A lot of people who I work with really like Raptor Red. Um, so that's got to say something about <laughs> the quality of it. Although, honestly, a lot of paleo people do still like Jurassic Park as well, even though we have beef with it. So, you know, I just negated my own statement. I don't know if it's a good uh, measure of how good it is or not, but that might be something cool to do some of your own research about. I know a lot of paleo media, if you go looking into their wikis, they'll actually have lists of inaccuracies that different dedicated fans keep up on, so it might be worth looking into for that to see if something like that is out there. Archaeology, paleontology, and classics are full of queer kids if that helps push anyone into it. Yes, no, seriously, we are <laughs> we're literally full of queer people. It's it's fantastic. I love it so much. Um, it is a very welcoming environment. Everyone, come come be a scientist. We're gay. You'll be gay. I'll all be gay. Every dinosaur was actually uh gay. Um. That's, that's a true fact, and you cannot dispute me. <laughs> I love that several people are typing that popped up when I was saying that. <laughs> that was funnier than it should have been. My husband and I still want to go on digs sometime. Yeah, so there are, uh, I do have to caution you a little, there are a lot of laws about it. Um, but there are also a lot of places where you can go and legally dig for things. Um, I believe up in Green River the Green River Formation up towards Montana. Um, shoot me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, there is a really good uh, area where you are able to pay a small fee and then go out and dig and keep anything you find. Um, oh, yep, we're about to wrap up. Sorry, guys. Um, so definitely look into that, and then look into your local laws as well as BLM laws as a good rule of thumb. If it has a backbone, don't move it. Don't even, like, pick it up. Leave it in the ground. Go to a museum. Tell them about it. We'll come look at it. Um, you know, and <laughs> we'll be very grateful. The meteorite was extremely homophobic. It's very sad. For COVID, we're going to go to the Natural History Museum of Utah field trip. I want to volunteer at a dig site, though. Oh, gotcha. Oh, God, I want to work at that museum so bad. It's one of my goals. My girlfriend lives in Salt Lake, so I would like to 
live there also. <laughs> it would be really nice. Um, everyone, g email them, put, put in a good word for me. Uh, give me a- and I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, don't do that. Um, it is time now, so we do have to go. Um, thank you all so much for joining me. Um, the humans did not live alongside dinosaurs. Um, thank you all so much for joining me today, um, and being patient with me while I was figuring everything out. Um, I'm glad you guys enjoyed my panel, I had a lot of fun talking to you all. Um, please, 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 please support our museum, come visit us, donate whatever you want, and I always appreciate it if you want to DM me for commissions or buy one of my stickers, I'll mail them out to you. Um, or if you want to give me a little tip at my Kofi, which I will send uh, links to everything again in the chat. Um, and if you want to support me, so I can go get a little treat after this. Uh, thank you guys so much, this was so fun. Uh, you have a great community. I hope to see you guys all again another year.